you. Uh, so this is primarily a technical talk, uh, and uh, I'll be presenting a mathematical model of uh, a portion of the neocortex. I hesitate to uh, claim that, uh, uh, that you'll be able to understand everything in this talk, uh, but the mathematical model uh, doesn't include any equations. Uh, it includes only graphical models, uh, which I'll explain uh, as we go along, uh, and those graphical models uh, have a mathematical semantics uh, that I hope you'll find uh, natural to understand. Uh, there was a second or alternative title to the talk, uh, Why Google Might Want to Be in the Neocortex Business, uh, and the idea behind that uh, is to consider uh, much in the same vein as why might General Motors be in the business of um, extruded plastics, for example. Uh, and the answer, of course, is that they use more extruded plastics in their automobiles than anybody else uh, in the country. So here, uh, we're talking about an enabling technology uh, that is just in its early stages uh, and that Google might want to invest in. So uh, this is joint work uh, with Glenn uh, and with Rich Washington, some second ago, uh, and with Jim Lloyd. So Jeff Hinton, uh, in a talk that he gave uh, at Ichikai in, in 2005 uh, on the event of him uh, being awarded the Research Excellence Award, uh, asked the following question. What kind of graphical model is the brain? And I think Jeff would probably agree with me on the first two uh, bullets. Uh, it's hierarchical uh, in the sense that it represents a hierarchy of concepts or representations. It's Bayesian. He might balk at Bayesian, but uh, I don't think so too much anyway. It's stochastic and generative uh, in the sense that you can use this model uh, to generate the kinds of stimuli uh, that the brain normally receives. Uh, the third item, though, uh, the idea that it's temporal and predictive uh, is something that Jeff uh, might resist. Uh, however, another Jeff, Jeff Hawkins, uh, would uh, thoroughly embrace uh, such a model. And finally, the idea that it's continuously adaptive, uh, I think anybody would agree to. Uh, unfortunately, from a purely mathematical point of view, uh, we're off in uh, deep waters once we consider uh, this more variety of, of model. So why should get Google care about these types of models? Right now, um, my understanding is that uh, Google is very much interested in uh, image uh, understanding of a wide variety. Uh, they need it for such tasks as uh, detecting whether or not there's pornography on a website, uh, filtering spam, and the like. And the techniques that are used currently uh, are primarily ones uh, that involve what's called discriminative learning. Uh, in particular, uh, these techniques are supervised. Uh, and luckily, for these cases, there's lots of labeled data. So supervised learning methods uh, work quite well. Uh, the kind of models I'll be talking about today are primarily unsupervised. Uh, and so they go beyond uh, what you would normally be able to handle within a discriminative framework. Uh, and they necessarily generate concepts uh, that are not necessarily accessible uh, in the sense that uh, since uh, the machine will be learning these new concepts and new concept hierarchies, um, they won't then be ones that will necessarily uh, accord with our uh, intuitions about uh, the internals of, uh, of such models. So um, I think that, that people will agree Another pajamas, that's great. Uh, only two in the audience, though. Uh, 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 I, I think that everybody will agree that, that Google is, in some sense, the grand content addressable memory. Uh, and uh, the kinds of generative models that we're looking at certainly have that flavor. Um, we're also interested uh, in what I call coincidence-driven associations. Uh, for example, two things residing on the same web page uh, can, uh, at least if there's uh, more than one occurrence of this, uh, indicate a relationship uh, that you might want to encode. Uh, the models that we're looking at are fundamentally sequence-based. Uh, 
and even though a lot of the models that Google currently uses uh, are based on uh, models that are non-sequence based, sort of bag of words, um, more and more Google is moving uh, to taking advantage of uh, the sequential nature of, of text and video and the like. And finally, uh, the things that Google is most interested in uh, involve multiple modalities. So uh, this is uh, an attempt to compare text-based inference uh, and image inference, in particular video uh, inference. Uh, and in the middle, uh, I've shown uh, the primary uh, channels uh, or the visual pathways uh, in the cortex leading back from the eye and the retina uh, to the back of the brain where the primary visual cortex uh, exists. And on the left and right um, are supposed to be uh, the sequence of, of, or the hierarchy in reverse order of abstraction of concepts. Uh, and I've gratuitously included uh, three textbooks uh, on the left. Um, two uh, are ones that I wrote, uh, and one is one that Peter wrote uh, that I thought I'd better throw in just for good measure. Uh, uh, and, um, <laughs> uh, and, and these are sort of uh, classic examples of linear text. And if you break them down to their most primitive constituent uh, pieces, uh, that corresponds to characters. Uh, and then we build them up uh, in more and more complex abstractions by compositing uh, the more primitive elements. Uh, so the, the sort of, of metrics and, and signatures that we use for web pages today um, are often in terms of things called term frequency vectors. Uh, and the next step beyond that uh, would be to start taking order into account uh, using n-grams and the like. Uh, in terms of a video sequence, the smallest constituent points would be pixels. Uh, and then a somewhat more amorphous concept than words, uh, but still relevant uh, in the machine vision world is the notion of a patch. Um, and then the analog of term frequency vectors uh, would be uh, to take some basis uh, that you would use to filter images or image uh, sequences uh, and use that to construct uh, a set of coefficients uh, and those coefficients would correspond to a signature in much the same way uh, that a term frequency vector would. Uh, you could then composite those in various ways. And if you think about uh, the structure of the brain, uh, in many ways uh, the information that's available as, it, as it's uh, fed into the cortex uh, is much the same at the level of term frequency vectors. Uh, in this case, uh, there would be uh, a basis uh, on, that would correspond to uh, Haar wavelets, for example, uh, or uh, uh, one of another families of such uh, filters. But beyond that, um, you start to build up a complex hierarchy that takes into account uh, um, features that span larger degrees of, of both space and time. And, and that's the primary uh, topic uh, today, describing how those features could be constructed um, in an online learning mechanism. I'll start with some terminology. Um, and essentially, I'm going to take the, the neuroscience ideas and, and reduce them uh, to very simple elements, uh, and then build them back up. Uh, using the mathematical models uh, that I'll be presenting. So everybody's familiar with the idea of, of the cortex uh, as a sheet um, that uh, is crenellated and stretched over uh, the more primitive aspects of the cortex. Um, that sheet um, has a number of properties uh, that make it uh, a, an ideal target uh, for turning into a computational model. Uh, for one thing, um, it's the striations in a, in a horizontal vein um, are very regular. Uh, the cells that occur at different levels or layers within the cortex um, are very uh, are uniform, very homogeneous. Second, in a vertical mode, uh, there are what has often been called columns. These were first uh, referred to uh, as such uh, by Mountcastle uh, back in the 50s uh, and have since given rise to uh, essentially a cottage industry of people coming up with different ideas of cortical columns. There are now many columns and hyper columns um, and a variety of such structures. They are 
they tend to be anatomically distinct, um, and they've been posited to be uh, functionally distinct as well, um, though they're still somewhat controversial in terms of being a fundamental element of the cortex. Nevertheless, that's the framework, or that's the, that's the, the, the unit um, that we consider uh, of most interest. So the representation on the far right here um, shows a sort of honeycomb, a set of columns uh, that, that would correspond to essentially hypercolumns uh, in the parlance of Mount Castle. Each uh, hypercolumn would be about 100,000 cells, uh, about 60,000 neurons. Um, and uh, as we'll see, uh, it can be used to uh, recognize some, some relatively interesting um, but still primitive features uh, within the primary visual cortex. The next notion uh, is the notion of a receptive field. Uh, and this essentially you can think of as a portion of the periphery of the body. Uh, in the case of the eyes, uh, this would be some portion of the retina um, that uh, maps back uh, to a cell uh, and on which uh, the cell's response is dependent. Uh, the, uh, the, as you move further and further back along the visual pathways, uh, the receptive fields tend to span um, a larger and larger portion of the overall visual field. Um, I don't know how well that shows up, um, but we're interested in uh, a particular portion of the visual pathways, um, and it's called the ventral visual pathway, uh, and it corresponds to um, the striate cortex, um, or area V1, uh, V2, uh, V4, and IT. Uh, it's not necessary that you know what those, uh, those mean in any sense, uh, other than uh, that they are areas that have a, a distinct anatomical uh, structure, and that, uh, that Eubel and Wiesel discovered uh, that as the cells uh, transfer information from one area to another, uh, they manage to maintain what's called a retinopic mapping, uh, which essentially preserves a lot of the spatial and structural characteristics um, of the images as they first appear on the retina. Um, so this area, the, the, or this pathway, the ventral visual pathway, uh, is the area that is most aligned with the notion of uh, what you see rather than where you see it. Um, so it gives you features that characterize the what, the what kinds of things that are out there, but not necessarily um, their overall spatial organization. The last concept um, that we'll draw upon in the following is, is a distinction between simple uh, and complex cells. Uh, this was terminology that was introduced by Eubel and Wiesel uh, back in the 60s, uh, and uh, it uh, is often misunderstood, um, but really it's a fairly simple concept. Um, all of the purple cells on the bottom things, uh, those correspond to simple cells. Um, there's only one complex cell shown here, and it's the orange on the right. Um, above each of the, the lower graphics, um, there's a, uh, a small graphic that shows uh, the response uh, of a given cell uh, to a stimuli uh, that is inside of its visual field. So the larger box there, uh, the gray uh, box, corresponds to the receptive field of the cell. Uh, and the white bar corresponds to the stimuli. And in this case, uh, for the simple cell, um, the simple cell is going to respond to a bar oriented at a certain uh, orientation uh, and positioned uh, right in the center of the visual field. Uh, and that's all that it responds to. Um, and you can see uh, off to the right a little bit uh, the spike train uh, or a simulated spike train of what would result um, if you exposed uh, the cell to that stimuli. Oops. Uh, on the right, um, it shows a complex cell. Now, this complex cell also responds to a, a bar at, at the same orientation as the simple cell. Uh, the only difference uh, is that this, in this case, it responds to that bar wherever it appears within the visual field. Um, it's said to be invariant with respect to the position of the bar within the visual field. But not the angle. But not the angle. Right, so it's specific to some things and invariant to others. <laughs>
So the characteristics uh, that we're looking, yes? Uh, simple cells connect to simple cells, so you can have a simple cell, all of whose receptive fields, in some sense, correspond to the input, or the output of other simple cells. Sure. Uh, and then complex cells uh, take simple cells as input. Complex cells also take other complex cells as input. So uh, we're interested in these models uh, because they provide uh, a hierarchical model, hierarchy in terms of a set of abstractions. Um, those abstractions. Uh, tend to be primarily in the first levels of the visual cortex, um, spatial and temporal abstractions. Um, these things are capable of pattern recognition um, of a sort that we would very much like to see in uh, modern AI systems, and pattern completion in the sense uh, that we hallucinate in some controlled way uh, portions of objects that are occluded by other objects. The invariants that are learned in these systems uh, provide uh, an alternative to uh, the kind of iterative computation that we would typically do uh, in an algorithm that does search. Uh, and invariants uh, allow us to get away uh, without performing a great deal of such search. Um, and as before, the idea that we'd be able to uh, represent input from various modalities. Um, this uh, uh, stack on the left um, and the row on the right um, is meant to represent uh, that visual or the, temp uh, the, um, the ventral visual pathway that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and of course, uh, even though it's arranged on the sh flat sheet of the cortex uh, as a set of separate areas interconnected uh, by neurons, I like to think of it um, as the stack on the left uh, with information feeding in from the bottom. Uh, the information from V1 uh, would be via uh, the retina and the lateral geniculate, so it's the raw input. Um, and that input, I shouldn't say raw, it's processed in a number of ways. And in particular, we're going to assume uh, that we have a basis uh, and a set of coefficients that we've used to uh, pre-process the images uh, as they would appear in the retina so that they are both uh, uh, contrast uh, and illumination invariant. Um, and that's the raw input to V1. And I'm going to introduce four uh, design elements. And by the way, each of these design elements has an associated paper. Uh, and if you can read and understand those four papers, uh, I think you'll have a good grasp of some of the main ideas uh, in neuroscience today. Um, the first uh, is um, a, a, a paper by uh, Fukushima. Um, on what he called the neocognitron. Uh, and at the time, um, it was uh, perhaps the most ambitious model uh, for representing um, visual information uh, and characterizing the early parts of, 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 of the visual pathways. Now, Fukushima is not the first person to suggest uh, that we would represent um, complex objects in terms of a hierarchy of conjunctions of simpler patterns. Um, but it was one of the primary uh, ones in the early days of, of machine vision. Uh, I've been told that in uh, the area of, of uh, understanding speech, uh, there are precursors to this uh, that have much the same flavor of the work of Fukushima. Uh, the second one uh, may seem like a trivial idea, uh, but it's essential uh, in the, uh, the learning that we do. Um, Peter Foldiak, in his uh, 1991 uh, PhD thesis at Harvard, um, described uh, a phenomena whereby uh, the, the way that we perceive our environment uh, is that we try to slow things down. We try to find representations that persist, uh, that are stable uh, across both space and time. Uh, and the intuition is that, that the world is a blooming, buzzing, uh, busy place. Uh, uh, moving far too quickly for us to account for. Uh, and so we need to filter out that um, and extract features uh, that move much more slowly. More recently, uh, the idea has come to play in work uh, by uh, Lauren uh, Wiscott uh, and, uh, and Sosnowski uh, in a framework that they call slow feature analysis, which has much the same 
um, idea as the earlier work by Peter Foldiak. The third um, is yet another simple idea uh, that executed correctly uh, makes for a, a very interesting um, and necessary uh, um, balance relative to some of the other mechanisms. When you perform invariant recognition, um, what are you doing? Um, you are recognizing things uh, and ignoring certain aspects. In the case that I, example that I gave of the complex cell a second ago, uh, what you're ignoring is the exact position uh, within the receptive field. That kind of sloppiness, as it were, um, allows you to recognize things quite easily, uh, but also results in, in false positives. So um, Ullman and Solovev uh, suggested a method um, that they showed uh, has biological plausibility uh, in which, very simply, uh, you first recognize by using these invariant uh, methods, uh, and then you filter uh, by looking at how different receptive fields overlap to make sure that they're consistent with one another. Um, so the fact that in one area you see a, a horizontal line um, and in an adjacent or overlapping region you see another horizontal line, those lines have to line up um, in order to provide a consistent overall representation. And the final idea uh, is uh, work which has the paper that I would suggest is a, is a paper by um, Tysing Lee and David Mumford uh, but David Mumford has been working on this basic idea since early uh, in the 90s. Uh, and it is an attempt to uh, cast what's going on in the visual pathways uh, in terms of Bayesian inference uh, and the propagation of information up and down a hierarchy. Uh, now, to some extent, uh, this has not uh, received as much appreciation as I think it deserves, in part uh, because human beings are able to recognize things uh, with an, an amazing ability, uh, which does not appear, given the timing information, uh, to require any feedback. Uh, one way to, to, to think about this uh, is that when we're asked to do a simple recognition task, um, often uh, we will be given a series of images, and then later on asked to recall whether or not we've seen those images at all. And it would seem, at first blush, that you're actually analyzing those pictures and you're realizing that you're seeing a picture of a cow um, and a farm. Uh, and that's the cue that you use to realize whether or not you've seen it before. But another explanation um, is that you're learning it in much the same way that you extract uh, a set of wavelet coefficients from an image um, or term frequency vectors uh, from a document. That is to say that you can establish a signature, which is pretty good at recognizing whether you've seen it or not, in fact, quite good, um, but not at all good uh, in terms of uh, understanding what the content of that image actually is. So we're going to work our way backwards from those four topics. Um, and we're going to start uh, with the basic idea of uh, Bayesian inference uh, in a hierarchical model. Uh, on the top graphic, uh, you'll see three boxes that correspond to, uh, say, three areas of the uh, ventral visual pathway. Um, area V1, V2, uh, and V4. And uh, the, the framework uh, is that each box represents a, uh, a random variable, or actually a large set of random variables. Uh, and the, those random variables represent a marginal distribution. And the distributions uh, taken as a whole, the three distributions, uh, can be composited to construct uh, a grand joint distribution. Um, and it's that grand distri joint distribution uh, which characterizes the operations of the cortex. Um, each of these boxes or random variables uh, corresponds to, uh, is, uh, receives information from the areas below it um, and the area above it uh, in the hierarchy. So uh, this is our first example of a graphical model. Um, the individual boxes correspond to random variables, um, and the arcs correspond to uh, information that would flow back and forth, um, capturing the dependencies uh, between uh, the different random variables. 
I'm going to use a really simple uh, graph as an example throughout the rest of the talk. Um, and you'll have to use your imagination uh, to, to think that this, in, this characterizes a cortex. Um, but the simple cartoon uh, will make it much simpler uh, for us to understand uh, the pieces down the road. So there's only nine variables in this graphical model. The arrows point in one direction, uh, but the arrows uh, simply represent uh, a conditional dependence. Uh, and you can always use Bayes' rule to reverse those arrows. So even though the arrows point in a single direction, information moves in both directions. Um, there are no arcs between the nodes within a, uh, a level. Uh, and that is because initially um, there are no arcs. Uh, we learn those arcs uh, in the process of constructing the hierarchical model. Uh, use your imagination um, so that uh, the, uh, the, the, the z variables, the, think of those as the, the variables corresponding to hypercolumns uh, in area V1. Uh, there won't be just five of them. Uh, there'll be something more on the likely of, uh, more on the, on the order of 100,000 or so. There are on the order of uh, 10 to the 11th cells uh, or neurons uh, in the neocortex uh, and 10 to the 14th connections. Um, but as I said, each one of these variables is going to represent a, a hypercolumn which consists of anywhere from 50 to 100,000 cells. Um, so given that um, as our basis uh, for our simple hierarchical models, um, and now remembering that uh, instead of having nine variables, um, it will have 900,000 variables or something on that order. Um, we're going to have to decompose it uh, into smaller components. And those components, um, each component um, is referred to as a subnetwork. Uh, and the different subnetworks are going to overlap. That's a good thing. Uh, and uh, those subnets are going to be sized in such a way uh, that it can be handled. All the inference involved uh, with respect to that subnet uh, can be handled on a single processor or a single core. Uh, and we're going to distribute uh, the process um, among a large number of cores uh, or processes, processors um, so that the subnets can communicate uh, through the variables that they share, the variables that they overlap. So now, given the previous slide where I showed you one subnet, um, imagine that, that the subnets all correspond to a node in one level uh, and all of the nodes that it points to, all its children on the level below. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to explode that, that graph uh, into a graph of subnets. Uh, where again, the subnets communicate um, by using potentials or, or marginal distributions, as it were, uh, that they, they contribute to one another uh, in a message passing architecture. Now, uh, I showed you a, uh, a hierarchy that was pyramid in shape, uh, but in fact, the models that we'll look at uh, will be anything but that. You can think of them as pretty much squares or truncated uh, pyramids. Uh, and the nodes at the different level will have the following behavior, uh, which is drawn from uh, work uh, Breitenberg on shoes on the structure of the, of the visual cortex in, in cats and monkeys. Uh, as you ascend the hierarchy, uh, the in and out degree of subnets uh, or of nodes in the graph doesn't change. Um, however, if you think of the hierarchy uh, the graph the, that we showed of nine nodes or nine million nodes um, as embedded in the obvious embedding in the three-dimensional space, uh, as you ascend the hierarchy, those, uh, the, the, the receptive field uh, for the subnets spans a larger and larger space. Um, and this means essentially uh, that as you ascend the hierarchy, the width of the graph restricted uh, to a given level becomes less and less, the diameter of the graph, that is the shortest, longest path uh, within that subgraph. Uh, 
So at this point, uh, you should have in your mind uh, a picture of a, a hierarchy corresponding to the first three levels or so of the visual cortex uh, looking something like this. It's, a, it's essentially a three-dimensional graph where each subnet um, is described as a pyramid. And uh, the pyramids, the base of the pyramids gets larger and larger uh, as you ascend the hierarchy. But as I mentioned uh, in the second slide, uh, that one of the main things about the graphical models that we're looking at is they're essentially sequence-based. And uh, so we want to think about how we can handle time. So this slide um, is meant to represent uh, essentially uh, three dimensions where the two spatial dimensions um, are uh, uh, compressed into a single line. So every horizontal line of cells uh, corresponds to uh, the entire input uh, at a given time. So it's two dimensionals corresponding to the two dimensions um, of the retinal field. Uh, and then time um, recedes into the vanishing point. Uh, and uh, at any given time, uh, the system, uh, the model, uh, will encompass uh, a certain set of those random variables. So this is a, uh, the grand model, as it were, uh, that, that represents all the space and time uh, that's available to the system to make inferences on. So the task of each level, and essentially each subnet, um, is to take its receptive field, shown here uh, in the little red box, and abstract that. Um, and given the model that I mentioned before uh, of Wiscott and Sesnowski and Peter Foljak's model uh, to extract a feature of that uh, that changes slowly over time. Uh, and the blue nodes on the top are meant to represent uh, the nodes in the next higher level uh, and to capture that kind of an abstraction. Is, is there some uh, criteria beyond, and this is, a tangent, I know, beyond uh, there, there must be some criterion beyond features that change slowly over time because you, know, the, you can come up with those lots of factors. Yes. Um, you have to at least avoid um, the obvious. Uh, um, there, there must be some sort of informative. We'll see it in just a second. So um, this is meant to um, abstract from the model that I showed you before with. Uh, the receptive field for a given subnet before the nine nodes below, um, and the process whereby that information is filtered uh, to ultimately get uh, the slow feature. Uh, and there are three pieces to this. Um, and each piece uh, can be thought of as a form of inference. Uh, and what we'll be doing over the next nine or 10 slides um, is going through the, the details of each piece of this inference um, and then at the end, we'll have a single graphical model uh, that will characterize all the behavior uh, and all the inference involved uh, in these three steps. So the very first step um, is one uh, in which we take uh, a set of variables. In this case, they are spatiotemporal variables. Um, so the receptive field covers not just space, but space and time. Uh, and we learn using unsupervised methods, uh, the distinct patterns uh, of, of spatiotemporal, uh, of, of change within those variables. Uh, we can use a method such as uh, mixtures of Gaussians in order to capture those patterns. Uh, or in the case of no, um, normative variables, uh, we can use a method such as naive Bayes or, or augmented naive Bayes. The next step, um, uh, we take in some sense, they, those patterns uh, or those prototypes um, that we've learned um, from looking at the spatiotemporal receptive field, and we look at their dynamics, how they change over time. And we actually learn a dynamical model that describes that, um, that evolutionary behavior. Uh, in doing so, uh, we learn a transition uh, matrix uh, that describes the evolution of those features. Uh, and we analyze that in the third step uh, in order to, to figure out 
features uh, that were moved slowly. Essentially what we do is we look at all those patterns uh, and their change over time and we group them in such a way um, that they now accord with slowly moving features. Uh, and I like to think about those uh, in, an, in an automata framework, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in just a second. So the obvious to anybody who works in speech uh, or, uh, or graphical models, the obvious model to use for this uh, is something called a hidden Markov model. Uh, and there are two characteristics of the hidden Markov model that are essential uh, to our interest uh, here. The idea is that you take an input space, usually a relatively high dimensional input space, such as the pixels in a small patch of an image, uh, and you reduce it uh, or map it onto a lower dimensional space. Uh, and so the downward pointing arrows correspond to the observation model uh, or the emission probabilities for a hidden Markov model. Having reduced it to a smaller space, uh, we then analyze the way that those, uh, those lower dimensional variables change over time. Uh, and so the vertical arrows correspond to the transition probabilities uh, of the hidden Markov model. How would we do that within the framework uh, that I described in the previous slides? Well, uh, let's take our, our, our single subnet um, as we in our exploded view from a few slides back. Uh, and we're going to construct the, a graphical model from this uh, over a series of steps. So the first step to think about um, is we're going to take uh, the graphical model within the, uh, the subnet and we're going to replicate it uh, in some number of slices. And the number of slices uh, will roughly correspond to what we believe uh, the ability of a hypercolumn uh, to store sort of traces of its past inputs. Uh, and then given those different slices, each of which corresponds to the simple model within the subnet, uh, we link them together with an arc uh, that indicates that those variables, uh, the x sub i's in this case, uh, are dependent temporally upon one another. <clears throat> now, in the graphic that we had four or five slides ago where I showed you uh, the three steps, um, two of those steps involved compression. So we took a receptive field uh, and we extracted the features mapping a high dimensional space onto a lower dimensional space. Uh, the net result um, was a compression in space. Uh, and in the top uh, or the third phase, we took the transitions of of those patterns over time, and we compress them temporally. When you compress time, uh, you tend to induce uh, additional uh, dependencies between your spatial variables. And when you compress space, uh, you tend to increase uh, the, uh, the order of the Markov process, that is the number of past steps uh, that the, that the random variable corresponding to the present time depends upon. So somehow we have to account uh, for these additional dependencies in our model. So back to uh, the model that we had before. Um, we start with this. And the first thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to introduce a latent variable. Uh, and that latent variable is going to capture uh, the evolution over time. So in the next slide, x sub i is going to disappear for a moment, uh, and we're going to replace it by a latent variable. Uh, here the latent variable uh, is uh, the variable sigma, uh, and I use the word, the, 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 the Greek sigma, uh, to indicate that uh, sigma ranges over an alphabet, an alphabet of prototypes, um, in some sense the signatures uh, for the patterns uh, that are recognized within the receptive field. Now these are the receptive field variables, um, and we, how we learn this uh, is we use uh, a method called um, uh, um, structural EM. And what structural EM does uh, is, in addition to learning uh, the conditional dependencies or the probabilities that essentially quantify these, higher, these graphical models, uh, it also learns the structure. 
So it learns which variables depend upon which others and introduces those variables, uh, those dependencies, uh, by adding additional arcs uh, to the graph. So when we're finished with this, pro this process, um, we have a model, which you can think of sort of as the observation or emission model uh, for the underlying uh, temporal model. The next step um, is we're going to learn the dynamics. And, and so now we have the replication of the observation model in every slice, uh, and we have arcs between uh, the, the sigma nodes uh, indicating that those are uh, temporally evolving variables. Uh, the variable at uh, time t, in this case, is potentially dependent upon the variable at t minus delta, t minus 2 delta, t minus 3 delta, et cetera. Uh, and again, we don't know that. Uh, a priori, we have to learn it. Um, in general, this can be a very bad idea uh, when trying to uh, represent uh, a model uh, in that the size of the distribution that's necessary to describe the transitions or the evolution of this process uh, would explode uh, in terms of the number of, of past stages that it depends on. So whatever the, the number of prototypes we have, um, the distribution is going to be uh, the product of, of the number of prototypes times the number of prototypes it depends upon in previous stages which is exponential uh, in the length of the entire chain. Um, and so what we do instead, uh, instead of learning a giant table whose dimension would be uh, the same number of slices uh, in our network, uh, we learn a tree structure, which tends to be very sparse, um, but still accounts uh, for uh, the essential um, temporal dependencies. You can think of what it's learning are the essential n-grams uh, that uh, are statistically regular uh, and commonly occurring. All right, so now we have our model, um, our temporal model. Uh, and we're going to uh, make the sigmas disappear for a moment. And that's because given a k-Markov model, you can always turn it into a first-order Markov model. Uh, by simply storing additional state information uh, within the state variable, which in this case is sigma. Um, but what we've done by learning just the n-grams, the essential n-grams, um, we've constructed a very compact space. Um, and so uh, we'll turn that into a first order model um, by having omega, in this case, range not over the prototypes, but over the n-grams that we learned uh, in the previous stage. And now, what we want to do is we want to learn the slow moving features. We've learned all the dynamics. We've figured out what the commonly occurring patterns. We've seen how they evolve over time. Uh, and so we're going to add back um, our x sub i's, uh, which correspond to, in some sense, the output of the subnet. Uh, and what's the role of the x sub i's? Uh, using the, the terminology that Peter Foldiak introduced, uh, of the notion of a slow feature, we're trying to extract things that tend to persist over time, um, and at the same time, that account for the essential features uh, and the inputs. So a brief digression. Um, this is not a graphical model. This looks like a graphical model, uh, or not a graphical model in the strict sense um, as it's used uh, in machine learning today. Uh, this is a state transition diagram. Uh, so in this case, uh, the circles correspond to the states uh, in a uh, simple process, uh, and the arcs correspond to transitions between those states. So I'm sure you've all seen state transition diagrams. Uh, this is a simple example. Uh, but this example illustrates uh, the idea of a slow feature. So uh, what happens uh, when you set this automaton loose? Uh, well, uh, if you started it in state one, you see it bounce back and forth between state one and two, most likely, uh, for some portion of time. Um, and upon entering each state or re-entering the state, if there's a self-transition, um, the, uh, the state essentially emits an output. Um, so as it's bopping back and forth between one and two, 
uh, you would see as output something that looks like A, A, B, 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 A, A, B, B, A, until finally um, it's going to jump out of uh, those two states to state four. Uh, and then with high probability, uh, it's going to bounce back and forth between three and four uh, for a time, uh, emitting a different signature, uh, in this case, uh, sequences of A's and C's. So in terms of a slow feature, what's going on? Um, you can abstract away from the nitty gritty details of the low level states uh, and say what's really interesting is, is it in a mode where it's emitting A's and C's or is it a mode where it's emitting A's and B's? Um, and those are the signature states or, or um, meta states uh, of the overall process. Uh, and that's what it is that we'd like to learn. Now, what would that actually mean in terms of uh, the kinds of things you would learn in, uh, say, learning visual features? Uh, well, the bouncing back in one and two uh, might correspond to, for example, uh, a very small portion of uh, an image or a pattern uh, moving across your visual field. So imagine that you're watching a box move across your overall visual field. Each of the individual cells corresponds to a small receptive field, a small window onto that larger image. And so what you might see um, is a small chevron, the corner of a box, um, moving through that little receptive field. And what you want it to learn is that it doesn't matter uh, where that chevron is within your receptive field, you always want to emit the same thing. On the other hand, if you see a chevron moving down, maybe you want to emit something different. Or if instead of a chevron, you see a straight line um, or an end stopped, um, you want to learn something different. So you learn what those features are. Um, and essentially, you're learning an invariant. Um, your, the, the invariants correspond to the modes uh, of the process that's illustrated here. So back to our model, um, the grand model um, that results from all of this is, uh, is shown here. Um, and I've reverted back uh, to uh, showing things in terms of sigma so I can make explicit the fact uh, that sigma depends not just on the previous pattern, uh, but on uh, possibly uh, the pattern before that and before that. Uh, and the model as a whole um, has uh, only one arc that you haven't seen before, and that's the, mark, the arc between um, x of t and x of t minus delta. What we would like to do in order to provide a precise characterization of the model um, is to, to uh, specify the graphical model, which we've done, uh, and then to be able to use an inference mechanism in order to learn the parameters of that model from the data, the data corresponding to uh, the information that's fed to the subnet um, from its chil children within the subnet hierarchy. And so that arc uh, between uh, x uh, t minus delta and x t uh, is meant to capture the dynamics of this slowly moving variable. Um, in order to make uh, it work, that is to ensure that in fact we do learn slow features, uh, we play a little trick. For those of you who know about using um, uh, priors uh, in, uh, in learning graphical models or learning of any sort, um, typically in graphical models you use what are called Dirichlet priors. And the way to think about that is um, the the probability of x sub t given x sub t minus delta uh, can be described as a table, the transition matrix, essentially, uh, for the, um, the x sub t's. And uh, what we do in terms of specifying a prior is uh, we populate uh, an initial table that looks, that essentially provides what are called pseudo counts, uh, and those pseudo counts reflect um, the bias that we have uh, to uh, discourage the parameters from moving too quickly um, during, uh, during learning using, for example, expectation maximization. All we do in order to ensure that we learn these uh, slow moving features uh, is we take this matrix of pseudo counts uh, and we look along the diagonal. The diagonal corresponds to the self transitions um, and we fatten it along the diagonal. Uh, 
So we increase the number of pseudo count, the, the numbers that correspond to the pseudo counts right along the diagonal, and that encourages uh, the system to learn features uh, that move very slowly. So we've been experimenting with a number of different methods um, that rely on these techniques, both using EM applied to the entire model as shown here, uh, but also uh, learning by composing uh, the different pieces of the learning process uh, that I mentioned in the previous slide, namely the emission probabilities, um, use the emission probabilities in order to uh, then learn the transition probabilities for the, the, um, the sigmas, uh, and then finally learn the uh, transition probabilities and the class variable, the x sub i's, uh, by simply looking at the transition matrix for the sigmas uh, and doing a form of spectral analysis. So that's the internal model. That's what goes on within a subnet, and that's how the subnet learns these slow-moving features. Uh, but the subnet is just one part of a much larger model. Um, and this is the same graph that we had before, uh, the exploded version of the graph. Uh, and I'm going to now say how, um, what the semantics for this entire model are. And in order to do so, I have to introduce the notion of a hierarchical hidden Markov model. So this is, again, an automaton, uh, except it's an automaton uh, that's factored uh, into uh, components. So the semantics of this uh, are that think of the top automaton corresponding to states one and two um, as being uh, a, um, the, the top of the hierarchy. Uh, and when you're in a given state, you do one of two things. Either your terminal state, uh, like this state here uh, in the second level, um, or you're a state uh, that involves uh, a, think of it as a procedure call, uh, such as the state here. Uh, and the dashed arcs correspond to the procedure calls. So what would happen in this case is you would start off in state one, uh, you would call the procedure here, uh, in state one of this uh, automaton, you'd admit an A. Um, then you'd go to state two. Uh, you may, at that point, either go back to state one or go down to this automaton. Uh, but eventually, um, the lowest automaton is going to go to its final state in which uh, control returns to the calling procedure. Uh, and it continues until it hits a uh, final state at which state returns uh, to the top level state and you continue with that. So that's the semantics uh, for a hierarchical hidden Markov model. Um, each of those automaton will correspond to um, the components that are learned by um, a subnet. Um, and we can cast the whole structure uh, in terms of a graphical model as shown here. So this is the same, uh, this is a, a representation of the same automata that we showed in the previous two slides. Uh, it has three levels. Um, and these corresponds to the state of uh, the different levels in the hierarchy. Um, so x uh, super n, the n is the level in the hierarchy, and the sub is the point in time. And we've also introduced some additional variables that correspond to the final state. And all they do uh, is indicate when the system uh, finally arrives at a final state. Uh, and that um, is then dependent upon the next higher level uh, that uh, models the characteristics of the procedure calling semantics that I gave in the previous slide. So what we expect um, is that uh, every level in the hierarchy only keeps track of a very short trace in time. Um, we want the model as a whole to capture concepts that range over our entire visual field uh, and that span large portions of time. Because, for example, uh, we'd be, like to be able to classify videos in such a way that we can capture very interesting features uh, that may involve not just a single frame, but many frames or span uh, many scenes uh, in the overall, uh, 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 the overall video. So um, here's the semantics, essentially, uh, for what happens within a level uh, that allows us to determine how uh, there's a different 
temporal resolution at every level. So imagine this is the input uh, to a given uh, subnet at a given level. Uh, and each of these boxes are meant to correspond to a binary distribution. Um, so this is uh, uh, a binary 0 and binary 1. And the black lines, in this case, correspond to the lowest level um, inputs to the system. And they happen at every, think of it, at every clock tick. But in a given level, uh, that the system essentially has smoothed out the signal. Um, so it's capturing a feature uh, that corresponds to its sampling uh, at a much lower rate. And so the green indications uh, are the sampling rate uh, for, for this subnet in receiving information from its children. Now, given the, the semantics and the model that we've described for a subnet as a whole, uh, essentially what it's trying to do is extract these slow moving features. And so the output uh, is one that will uh, be sampled even less frequently. Um, and uh, it's, so its spatial characteristics uh, are not essentially as a, as a, um, a, slow, uh, a low pass filter, uh, but rather that are ca capturing uh, the essential components at a somewhat slower frequency. So there's a potential problem with this. Um, if you imagined, as we had in the previous slide, a, a slice corresponding to every tick, uh, and we want to be able to spot, span large scenes within a, in a video uh, that might involve hundreds or thousands of frames, or millions of frames, um, we would have to build a very large network. And in particular, um, if, if you could imagine that at every level uh, we have the frequency um, that in this little network here, how, much, how, how many slices would we need uh, in order for level three uh, to be able to even have two samples uh, of, its, of its inputs? Uh, and the answer is uh, that uh, if, if we're assuming that uh, every subnet essentially has four slices, or small n, uh, that, and that every uh, subnet above it samples at half uh, the frequency, uh, then essentially uh, in some three, six, nine slices, uh, that's all the information uh, that our network would be able to get. However, we can go uh, at, at higher and higher levels uh, and note that all of these portions of the graphical model that are shown in dashed, we don't actually have to represent. All we're representing are the ones shown in black. Uh, and so we have a very compact representation uh, that scales linearly uh, in the number of levels in our hierarchy. OK. So um, that's the basic idea. Uh, the models have been uh, just begun to be tested. Um, these four key ideas, uh, there's a lot known about the cortex, uh, but uh, a lot of it is not easily translatable into engineering principles. Um, we believe that these four design elements um, are easily translatable uh, into design princi uh, into principles, engineering principles, um, and that's what we've been doing um, over the last uh, nine months or so. Uh, the, um, progress so far. Uh, we have MATLAB code uh, that runs on uh, in a single process on such examples as uh, the NIST uh, National Institute of Standards uh, digits libraries and data sets. Uh, the data set uh, that's being used by uh, Dilip George uh, at Numenta, a company whose basic business uh, is to build neocortexes. Um, and we've also built an MPI prototype that allowed us to explore some of the issues involved uh, in building distributed algorithms, uh, which Glenn uh, and Rich and Jim are working on now. Uh, we've translated the MATLAB uh, into a, a serial implementation uh, that's in C++. Uh, and we're working with a variety of people uh, in order to build the filters that will provide the first couple of layers uh, of the cortex. Uh, which will essentially be, as I said, uh, a method for uh, uh, invariance with respect to uh, illumination, 
uh, and contrast, uh, and a wavelet filter of a particular sort. Uh, and now um, we are trying to develop the last bits of the distributed system, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to debug that um, over the next month or so. Uh, and uh, beyond that, uh, I hope to come back here in another six months uh, or five months um, and give you some examples of the stuff that we've been able to do with this model. We are actively uh, pursuing uh, people to help with the project. Um, it's finally gotten to a, a point where I think uh, we really have some concrete tasks that people can work on. Uh, and we're seeking collaborations uh, with people in Google's uh, actually quite robust machine vision community uh, to help out with the process uh, and with some of the component problems. Um, I'd like to talk, uh, thank a few people that helped out with this. Um, Ethan Schreiber and, uh, and Teresa View uh, were the ones who did uh, the translations uh, to uh, from the MATLAB code to PNL. Um, Dalib George and Bobby Jaros at Numenta are good friends uh, and certainly have helped us. Uh, and they really are in the, in the, um, the business of building Cortexes. Uh, some folks at Sanford uh, and Kevin Murphy for uh, a piece of code that, that he's developed. It was a great uh, contribution to the community. It's called the BayesNet Toolbox, uh, which has also helped us uh, enormously. So thank you. Um, and if there's any time for questions, I'll be glad to take them.